um, how did you become a film critic and uh, why? What, what sort of drew you to, to this profession? It, always difficult to pinpoint the moment when you become a film critic, but I was really interested in film. Right from school, I started with a couple of friends, a French film society, because I think, like a number of people in my generation, a lot of your film education comes from watching BBC Two at that stage, which played a lot of foreign language films. So after that, when I got to university, my first published review, the one I can you know, actually see there, would have been from the late 70s, and it's Herzog's Stroschek. What a lovely film to begin with, actually. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I quite realised what I'd um, taken on at that well, point. <laughs> um, and um, may I ask now, um, I, mean, I think I know the answer to this question, mm -hmm. but do you, do you make a living from it or do you have a day job? Uh, yes, I do. Well, I'm a freelance, so it's very difficult to know what your day job is. But certainly, I would say that the majority of my earnings come from things to do with film at the moment. Yeah. I think the main purpose of film criticism is to engage people, as wide a range of people as you can, in a wonderful medium, a wonderful art form. Now, criticism is probably different from reviewing because criticism, I think of in a much wider term, in terms of context, in terms of history, in trying to explain what might really be going on, I mean, what you might call the what the fuck is going on here kind of element of a film. Not looking just at the surface, looking at, at the things underneath. It's And it's also opening up a kind of wider discussion. It's, it's like the perfect moment when you come out of a cinema watching with a number of other people and conversations spring out about what you've seen. Now the role of the film critic at its best is to provide part of that conversation. It may be before people have seen the film. Something that is opening out where they have various access points and a really good critic will do that, will make it a much richer experience. And you, um, you know, unlike most of the other critics that we, we've interviewed so far, I mean, you work in radio as well as in writing, and do you find um, when you're performing your kind of critical role, if I can put it that way, in, in, uh, on radio, like on air, um, in, in a certain respect, is that the ideal form of discourse for the discussion of film, like to have an actual conversation with someone rather than simply to... I'm not sure it's the ideal way. It's certainly one way of doing it. And I think in some ways uh, a, a discussion does represent, if you like, a kind of stylized form of that conversation you might have when you come out of the cinema. So I don't think that the role particularly uh, of the sort of programme that I do is to say you absolutely should see this or you absolutely shouldn't see this. I think it's more to say this is what is of note about this this is why it's interesting because it comes from this tradition or it points a way to something new or there is something different about the way things, are, ideas are being expressed. And I think in, in that sense, it's, um, you know, a, a discussion can be a way, a sort of inclusive way. You want, the, you want the audience to feel that they could take part in it as well. And, um, I mean, you've mentioned uh, aspects of criticism like contextualisation, uh, looking at the historical context or looking at genre context. Um, and analysis, uh, so going a little bit beyond evaluation, I guess, like, you know, whether the film is good or bad. But, um, but nonetheless, um, it's true that a lot of um, readers and perhaps listeners um, look for guidance in that area as well. And I, I, I wonder how important you think evaluation is to the art of criticism. I think evaluation can be tremendously important to people, but I think you should, you know, should always be aware that, that taste is part of this. Evaluation is important. I mean, you do have to occasionally just say, look, I think whether this is good or bad. If you think something's meretricious or you think it's shoddily done or you think it's just repetitive or copying something else, then absolutely it's your duty to say so. But it's also true that within evaluation, a lot of that is down to taste and personal preference and all sorts of things that can't always be laid out. You can't always be honest about that because nobody knows entirely how their taste is formed. And I don't think it's the role of the critic to be a taste maker. I think you have to appreciate that even some films that you don't like may well appeal on a strong, you know, emotional basis, possibly even intellectual basis to other people in a way that you don't understand. That's why I think you have to be careful with evaluation. We were just talking about evaluation and mm. um, I wonder about, um, where within this area mm. are star ratings fit? Like, do they have any validity at all? What is their validity? What do they reveal about a film or should they just be abolished? Are they there just for the marketers? I can see why star, but I can see why star ratings are attractive to readers who have to make instant decisions about where they're going to go that night, and they may find that. But I think they're really deceptive and really tricky, and they would always be three-star films. 
but I love them and I will see them over and over again because for me they work. Uh, there are a lot of five star films which are beautifully executed and utterly forgettable. So I think it's, it's more important to engage people with something that, that much actually resonate with them than just with some kind of arbitrary sarcasm. And have you ever, within your own you know, experience mm. of writing, had a star rating changed editorially? No, I haven't because I've never actually had this. Oh, occasionally, I suppose I've had. That's true. I haven't. No, I've never had anything changed. But I've only, I've only, on the whole, written for a couple of things where they've asked Wait, me to do a star rating. Yeah. Obviously, you have a much wider range of voices these days, um, and clearly many more places where people can write. When I started out, I think one was very much aware that there were Olympians who wrote for the broadsheets or for magazines like Sight and Sound, and uh, the rest of us were enormously in awe of them, and indeed their, you know, their predecessors and well-known film academics. Now, you know, you could go the full range from bloggers or who, whoever it is, actually, or somebody you hear on the wireless or kind of democratisation. On the other hand, what it seems to have done is kind of polarised it even more, that you still have those the whole range of it, but there's far more attention probably paid to the noisier, more populist side. I'm not sure that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it's a noisy populist medium, but uh, it means that it's fragmented, and I think that probably it'll be interesting to see what happens in sort of 10 or 15 years' time. Um, where do you think that um, the rise of um, online journalism and also just social media um, fits into this? Like, do you think that... Um, that the, 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 the sort of the growth of the World Wide Web has um, is is overall a, a good thing or a bad thing for cinema or just an indifferent thing for, for film not for cinema but for film criticism. Um. Clearly, the, the fact that there are so many voices online and so many different ways of expressing an opinion about a film this has to be good, I guess, for the marketers because that's how word spreads. So, if you like, the kind of village pump <laughs> part of it is very well served by. Uh, by the internet. On the other hand, you find that it, it's not so easy necessarily to find really extraordinary things that people tend to, it tends to be very much kind of visceral thing, I, I like this or I don't like this, I like that kind of thing or I don't like that kind of thing. It's not enough, that kind of thing, as far as genre is concerned, for me to like it. Um, and then it becomes quite sort of sterile and shorthand. Uh, so I'm not sure that it necessarily, I mean, the problem is there are so many different kinds of criticism anyway. Um, there isn't just good criticism and bad criticism. There is the kind that's very much rooted in history. There is the kind that is, if you like, the great stylist things, the good essay writers, where you need never see the film <laughs> and still appreciate how good it is. You just love the writing. You understand where it sits in a, in a cultural landscape. And there's quite a lot to be said for that. And if film is the cause of it, then great. And there's a tradition in that that goes way back to Irish Barry and uh, people like that, you know, where you can understand that the film is the trigger, but that also there may be a, a wider consideration here as well. Um, and then there's the absolutely, this is, you know, I saw it two hours ago or five minutes ago, and this is what I think. And there are different markets for all of these, but I think if it only became the knee jerk, I like this, I don't like this, do you like this, I don't like it, then if it's just that binary kind of thing, then that frankly isn't criticism at all. The question about whether it's more important if you're paid uh, is an interesting one because clearly there is a kind of discipline about being paid for things and that's absolutely, if, if you're doing it professionally, there is a kind of seriousness, I guess. I mean, that's not to say that many amateur film critics are not serious because they are, but there is something about having to provide at a certain time a certain number of words for a particular audience and having to be sensitive to that, that certainly works as a very good discipline, I think. Um, the problem for the non-professional film critic is that you know, it's really hard for them to get read in numbers unless they have a particular sort of gimmick or feature attached to them, unless, unless they have somebody, if they can piggyback on the back of some other existing media thing. So I actually don't think it's, it's like saying, you know, that the fact that it became so much cheaper to make a film meant that many more brilliant films were going to emerge. Well, there may have been many more brilliant films made, but the problem was that none of them got through in terms of distribution. None of us know about them. And I think it will be the same with film criticism. 
I think it's wrong that people should write and not be rewarded or at least recognised in some way. I understand how the economics of the things work insofar as there are more people who want to be published than there are people prepared to pay for it. <laughs> and that does, but I still think it's wrong. I mean, I'm with Ken Loach in a sense on this, that, you know, if you're on a film set that you should be paid, even if you're not paid a huge amount, I think that you should be paid in some way. Um, otherwise, it's difficult to know what the selection process is. Now, it may be for some people the reward is just being selected, but I think you need to know that what you're doing is recognised and rewarded in some way. Absolutely. I mean, this is this has always been the problem with um, criticism, but it's more it's exacerbated now. It seems worse now because there are so many more people who feel they can have a go at it because they can do the first stage of it. Um, and before, people probably didn't even think they could attempt it unless they tried to review something for the local paper or whatever. Local paper won't bother with film reviews probably now, but, um, okay. Um, Should we just keep the hot well, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I think the problem about the fact that there are so many people now who can post a review online is that uh, there are a lot of people who would like to, that the truly distinctive voices are going to have as much trouble as ever getting through. If anything, I think slightly more, because there is, if you like, such a cacophony of people all pouring in with, with what they want to say. Whereas before, you know, you might have reviewed for your local film society or for your local paper, and there were, if you like, a number of different um, tributaries that ran into Geography. Do tributaries run into things or do they run out? <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> they're not from different sources, so went, I'll go, go, but, I'll go. Um, I'll take that again from but the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds oh, wrong. Been um, very painstaking about your metaphors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, I think there there is a problem that because there are so many people now who have the ability. Then you know, you've got a keyboard, you can put it out there. Um, Whereas before, if you wanted to write a review, your channels were, you wrote something for the local film society or for the local paper, you might possibly get up to sort of some kind, something approaching regional, if not national level. But it was a, it was a fairly straightforward way of submitting your reviews. Now, you know, you could turn out a dozen a week and not know where they were going out into the ether. And I think the problem is that actually, it paradoxically makes it more difficult for distinctive voices to arise because everybody's shouting in the same room and uh, also the people who will employ and eventually give those distinctive voices space to develop as stylists because people do need that time and space they're not going to know where to look because there's so much and I think that that is it, it's a real problem in some ways it is the classic free market situation uh, but it also means that an awful lot of people fall by the wayside um I know that when uh, critics first were identified by name, so we're talking about in the, the mid-1910s yeah. and the 1920s, um, actually the, the, fir the first really well-known critics in the UK were C.A. Lejeune and Iris Barry, sort of mm. a female, um, which kind of, kind of might now, maybe now it doesn't seem so strange, but uh, what I wanted to ask is, um, over the years that you've spent as a film critic, have you found that uh, that in any way reflected the kind of landscape that you were inhabiting? Um, what, were there a lot of female voices amongst the, the kind of body of official film critics, um, and has that been improve, Has representation been improving, or has it stayed much the same? What's, what's the landscape been like? Well, I grew up being aware of figures like Dillis Powell um, there as critics, and obviously it was sort of later that I really got to know about the history of people like. Lejeune and Iris Barry. So, uh, but Penelope Houston was editor of Sight and Sound you know, for, <laughs> for such a great length of time as well. And I think it, it never occurred to me that women didn't write film criticism. That never occurred to me until the reality of actually looking at how many were in those senior figures you sort of hit home actually later, really. Um, because I, I suppose, you know, my parents got kind of one paper or two papers, so I just thought, sort of thought, oh, it's Dillis Powell, that's it. And I think that it, I was a bit shocked later on to discover that there weren't that many, at least not that many who did it for very long. 
tended to be that uh, women would have a go at being the film critic for a while and then they'd be moved on to something else, perhaps on the features desk. So I think it's not necessarily still can have, you know, great areas where it is mainly male dominated. Why is that? Because possibly men are a lot better still at saying, this is my opinion, this is how I would like to say it, this is the way I put it. And women will be women will be more diffident and cautious about making sure that what they're saying is correct and that it's set in the proper historical context and those kind of things. So therefore, possibly for every you know, seven or eight men who put forward a review, there may only be one or two women, and that may still be true. But the qualities that you're ascribing to women are precisely the qualities that good critics should have. So, well, um, <laughs> well, maybe they are. I mean, maybe those are exactly the things that you want um, together with a certain kind of style as well. Obviously, you need that too. Uh, so I think they're often, you know, very often women do make extremely good critics, but think they have been and continue to be a little. And I'm, you know, I'm the mother of two daughters, one of whom is now starting to write her first you know, she's at university and she's just started to write a few things and uh, she is conscious that you know it will tend to be that she actually had to say I think I have a view on this I think this is what I feel about and that, that was even now even now in you know, 2016 that was still something that it took a little bit of effort to do um and this is going to sound like a strange question but um but why do you think well, do you think yeah. it's important um, to have um, a, a sort of more egalitarian representation of female voices, sort of voices from people of colour, a voice from different sexualities? I mean, is it important or does it not matter what the identity of the individual critic is or the collective critic is? I'm not sure that you need to know what the identity is, but I think it's important that you have those range of people writing. I mean, I'm not sure that you need to declare, you need to have it declared at the beginning of a piece of writing about film, who is writing it, but absolutely it is important because there certainly was and remains in, in some areas a kind of um, uniformity of tone and perspective. That is quite off-putting even to me. <laughs> and so I think that, that you certainly would like to hear as many forms of cinema as there are, you would like to hear from as wide a range of people reacting to it, because it benefits all of us, you know, it, it gives us all different entry points to this fascinating medium, and if it is just, if it just belongs to a group of white males, then, you know, already I'm excluded. And so, goodness knows how, you know, how much more narrow it must seem to other people. And do you think that that has now improved? I mean, is the, is the, um, the, 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 the landscape better? The landscape is going to, my God, it's taking a long time, you know. So I thought in, I left university at the end of the 70s and you thought after second wave feminism, after various civil rights movements, you thought, well, here we are, this is going to be a cultural discourse that's open to all and then carries on being narrower and narrower. And in fact, even in the last 10 years, I think at one point it seemed to get narrower. Uh, so I hope, I hope. And also, I mean, apart from questions like the, the ones I've just asked you, um, yeah. do you, have you faced, um, like, have you yourself personally encountered discrimination while, while a film group? I don't think I've encountered discrimination as such, but I think there might have been assumptions about the, the kinds of films that I would be interested in, which is not the same thing, but an aspect of it. What kind of films? I mean, I think I know what you're going to say. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, that, you know, the assumption that I would like, as it were, certain kinds of dramas, that I would like literary adaptations of a certain kind or particular... No, it's true, I probably do quite like this, but actually all sorts of things, you know, whether it be from horror to action films or whatever, you, I, you know, that's the whole joy of cinema is that... It, it doesn't have to be prescriptive in that way, that you can go in there and see whatever you like for 90 minutes or so and be that, at least in part, that person. So to imagine that, you know, I have nothing to say about it because I don't fall into that demographic. I mean, that, that would be to be as narrow as some of the marketing of these films is. Well, but one of the reasons I think criticism is still important is precisely because of the way that 
so many of us consume film now, which is that we don't have the perfect situation of going to a cinema, watching with other people, and having maybe time to talk about it afterwards. Because so many films are consumed in a solitary way, or maybe, you know, with one other person. But criticism at its best can provide at least a starting point for some of those sort of thoughts, that thinking about it afterwards, um, the, the sort of the seed of the conversation, even if the conversation is not had out loud, the idea that it enriches your enjoyment of the medium because you've got somebody else to engage with on it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to kind of start off the mental gymnastics. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah exactly. Which is something to grapple with. I think that's that, that would be the reason for keeping it, really. Um, not to say you should spend your £10 or you shouldn't spend your £10 plus on this, because that's a much more difficult thing, I think, to predict. Um, that, it's, it's interesting, though. Uh, I, I mean, I can, I, I can tell you categorically yeah. that probably over half of the people we've interviewed yeah. really do think that is what criticism is for. It's to, that they say the bottom line is telling the reader whether or not they, whether should, they should spend their £10. Pounds. Um, yeah. Close. And I, I, I think... <laughs> I think I think the problem the problem is, and the problem is that you can tell the reader how whether or not they should spend their ten pounds, but there's absolutely no guarantee that you're right. And actually, the number of times that you hear people say, "Well, this had a four or three or you know, this had a four star review," and I went to see it uh, as a result, and, and I hated really it, only a two. and it was rubbish. <laughs> uh, and I think it's very difficult to say. The most you can say is. If you're interested in this, if you know that it's a... Oh, and the other thing, that my other great bugbear is giving away the plot. Because I think that this is, this is lazy reviewing once you've actually got the great sort of plot synopsis. Um, that there's an awful lot of that as well. But, so you've already partly destroyed the fun of it. You have to give them some idea of what it's about. But you just can't... You can't possibly know, and it's a kind of arrogance to assume, that you will know whether or not people will enjoy this. You can say... This is part of the kind of the kind of things that are like this. It has this sort of element. It has that sort of thing. But who knows exactly how it's going to hit you? Yeah. 